The Story of Civilization, Volume 5, The Renaissance, Part 2, by Will Durant. Continued, Cassette 8, Side 1. Preachers complained about the amount of female bosom that invited the male eye. Now and then the flair for nudity went out of bounds, and Zacchetti observed of some women that if they took off their shoes they would be naked. Most women imprisoned themselves in corsets that could be tightened by turning a key, so that Petrarch pitied their bellies so cruelly squeezed that they suffer as much pain from vanity as the martyrs suffered for religion. Armed with all these weapons, the Renaissance woman of the upper classes raised her sex out of medieval bondage and monastic contempt to be almost the equal of man. She conversed on equal terms with him about literature and philosophy. She governed states with wisdom, like Isabella, or with all too masculine force, like Caterina Sforza. Sometimes, clad in armor, she followed her mate to the battlefield and bettered the instruction of his violence. She refused to leave the room when rough stories came up. She had a good stomach and could hear realistic language without losing her modesty or her charm. The Italian Renaissance is rich in women who made a high place for themselves by their intelligence or their virtue. Bianca Maria Visconti, who, in the absence of her husband, Francesco Sforza, governed Milan so capably that he used to say he had more confidence in her than in his whole army, and who at the same time was known for her piety, compassion, charity, and beauty of person. Or Emilia Pio, whose husband died in her youth, but who so cherished his memory that she was never known, through all her remaining years, to encourage the attentions of any man. Or Lucrezia Tornabuoni, mother and molder of Lorenzo the Magnificent, or Elisabetta Gonzaga, or Beatrice d'Este, or the maligned and gentle Lucrezia Borgia, or the Caterina Cornaro, who made Asolo a school for poets, artists, and gentlemen, or Veronica Gambara, the poetess and salonier of Correggio, or Vittoria Colonna, the untouched goddess of Michelangelo. Vittoria recaptured, without proud display, all the quiet virtue of a Roman heroine of the Republic, and combined with it the noblest features of Christianity. She had distinguished ancestry. Her father was Fabrizio Colonna, Grand Constable of the Kingdom of Naples. Her mother, Agnese de Montefeltro, was a daughter of Federigo, the scholarly Duke of Urbino. Betrothed in childhood to Ferrante Francesco d'Avalos, Marquis of Pescara, she married him at nineteen in 1509. And the love that united them before and after marriage was a finer poem than any of the sonnets that they exchanged during his campaigns. At the Battle of Ravenna in 1512, he was wounded almost to death and was taken prisoner. He took advantage of his captivity to compose a book of loves, which he dedicated to his wife. Meanwhile, he had carried on a liaison with one of Isabella d'Este's maids of honor. After his release, he returned to Vittoria briefly, then sallied forth on one campaign after another, so that she seldom saw him again. He led the forces of Charles V at Pavia in 1525 and won a decisive victory. Offered the crown of Naples if he would join a conspiracy against the emperor, he thought it over for a while, then revealed the plot to Charles. When he died in November 1525, he had not seen his wife for three years. Ignorant of or ignoring his infidelities, she spent her twenty-two years of widowhood in works of charity, piety, and devotion to his memory. When she was urged to marry again, she replied, My husband Ferdinand, who to you seems dead, is not dead to me. She lived in quiet retirement at Ischia, then in convents at Orvieto and Viterbo, then in semi-conventual privacy in Rome. There, while herself remaining apparently orthodox, she befriended several Italians who sympathized with the Reformation. For a time she was placed under the surveillance of the Inquisition, and to be her friend was to risk indictment for heresy. Michelangelo took the risk and developed for her an intense spiritual affection that never dared go beyond poetry. The educated women of the Renaissance emancipated themselves without any propaganda of emancipation, purely by their intelligence, character, and tact, and by the heightened sensitivity of men to their tangible and intangible charms. They influenced their time in every field, in politics by their ability to govern states for their absent husbands, in morals by their combination of freedom, good manners, and piety, in art by developing a matronly beauty which modeled a hundred Madonnas, in literature by opening their homes and their smiles to poets and scholars. 
There were innumerable satires on women, as in every age, but for every bitter or sarcastic line there were litanies of devotion and praise. The Italian Renaissance, like the French Enlightenment, was bisexual. Women moved into every sphere of life. Men ceased to be coarse and crude, and were molded to finer manners and speech. And civilization, with all its laxity and violence, took on a grace and refinement such as it had not known in Europe for a thousand years. 6. The Home The rising refinement showed itself in the form and life of the home. While the dwellings of the populace remained as before, unadorned whitewashed stucco or plaster walls, flagstone floors, an inner court usually with a well, and around the court one or two stories of rooms furnished with the simple necessaries of life, the palaces of the nobles and nouveau riche took on a splendor and luxury again recalling imperial Rome. The wealth that in the Middle Ages had been concentrated on the cathedral now poured itself out into mansions equipped with such furniture, conveniences, delicacies, and ornaments as could hardly be found, north of the Alps, in the seats of princes and kings. The Villa Chigi and the Palazzo Massimi, both designed by Baldassare Peruzzi, enclosed a labyrinth of rooms, each ornate with columns and pilasters, or fretted cornice, or gilded coffered ceiling, or paintings on vault and walls, or sculptured chimney pieces, or stucco carvings and arabesques, or floors of marble or tile. Every mansion had elegant beds, tables, chairs, chests, and cabinets built for a century and cut to please the eye. Its massive credenzas or buffets were loaded with silver plate and fancy pottery. It had soft and comfortable beds, fine carpets and handsome drapes, and linen abundant, enduring, and perfumed. Great fireplaces warmed the rooms, and lamps, torches, or chandeliers lighted them. All that was lacking in these palaces was children. For family limitation rises as the means for supporting children mount. The church and the scriptures bade men increase and multiply, but comfort counseled infertility. Even in the countryside, where children were economic assets, families of six children were rare. In the city, where children were liabilities, families were small, the richer, the smaller, and many homes had no children at all. What lovely children Italian families could have appears in the Bambini and Putti of the artists, the Cantorie of Donatello and Luca della Robbia, and such scriptural portraits as the young St. John of Antonio Rossellino in the Washington National Gallery. The solidarity of the family, the mutual loyalty and love of parents and children, stand out all the more attractively amid the moral looseness of the times. The family was still an economic, moral, and geographical unit. Usually the debts of one defaulting member were paid by the rest, a marked exception to the individualism of the age. Rarely did any member marry or leave the state without the family's consent. Servants were free-born, free-spoken members of the family. Paternal authority was supreme, and was obeyed in all crises, but normally the mother ruled the household. Maternal love was as fond in the princesses as in the paupers. Beatrice d'Este writes about her baby boy to her sister Isabella. I often wish that you could be here to see him, as I am quite sure that you would never be able to stop petting and kissing him. Most families of the middle class kept a register of births, marriages, deaths, and interesting events, interspersed here and there with intimate comments. In one such family record, Giovanni Ruccelli, ancestor of the dramatist of the same name, wrote toward the end of his life, circa 1460, these proud words of a Florentine. I thank God that he has created me a rational and immortal being, in a Christian country, close to Rome, the center of the Christian faith, in Italy, the noblest country in Christendom, and in Florence, the most beautiful city of the whole world. I thank our Lord for an excellent mother, who, though only in her twentieth year at the time of my father's death, refused all offers of marriage and devoted herself wholly to her children, and also for an equally excellent wife who loved me truly and cared most faithfully for both household and children, who was spared to me for many years and whose death has been the greatest loss that ever has or could have befallen me. Recalling all these innumerable favors and benefits, I now in my old age desire to detach myself from all earthly things in order to devote my whole soul to giving praise and thanks to Thee, my Lord, the living source of my being. Two men, who were perhaps one, wrote about 1436 treatises on the family and its governance. 
Agnolo Pandolfini was probably the author of an eloquent Trattato del Governo della Familia. Leon Battista Alberti soon afterward composed a Trattato della Familia, whose third book, Economico, is so largely similar to the earlier treatise that some have thought the two works were different forms of one essay by Alberti. Perhaps they are both genuine, so alike because they both based themselves upon Xenophon's Economicus. Pandolfini's performance is the better. Like the Rucella, he was a man of means, serving Florence as a diplomat and contributing generously to public causes. He wrote his treatise toward the end of a long life and cast it into the form of a dialogue with his three sons. They ask him should they seek public office. He advises against it as necessitating acts of dishonesty, cruelty, and theft, and as exposing one to suspicion, envy, and abuse. The sources of a man's happiness lie not in public office or fame, but in his wife and children, his economic success, his good repute, and his friends. A man should marry a wife sufficiently younger than himself to submit to his instruction and molding, and he should teach her, in the early years of their marriage, the obligations of motherhood and the arts of household management. A prosperous life comes from the economical and orderly use of health, talent, time, and money, of health through continence, exercise, and a moderate diet, of talent through study and the formation of honest character by religion and example, of time through shunning idleness, and of money through a careful accounting and balancing of income, expenditure, and savings. The wise man will invest first of all in a farm or estate, so arranged as to provide him and his family not only with a country residence, but with corn, wine, oil, fowl, wood, and as many as possible of the other necessities of life. It is well also to have a house in the city, so that the children may use the educational facilities there and learn some of the industrial arts. But the family should spend as much of the year as possible in the villa and the country. While every other possession causes work and danger, fear and disappointment, the villa brings a great and honorable advantage. The villa is always true and kind. In spring, the green trees and the song of the birds will make you joyful and hopeful. In autumn, a moderate exertion will bring forth a hundredfold. All through the year, melancholy will be banished from you. The villa is the spot where good and honest men love to congregate. Hasten thither and fly from the pride of the rich and the dishonor of evil men. To which one Giovanni Compano answered for a million million peasants. Had I not been born a rustic, I should readily have been touched with pleasure by these descriptions of rural happiness. However, having been a farmer, what to you are delights are to me a bore. 7. Public Morality Pandolfini was right in at least one judgment, that commercial and public morality was the least attractive side of Renaissance life. Then, as now, success, not virtue, was the standard by which men were judged. Even the righteous Pandolfino prays for wealth rather than for immortal life. Then, as now, men itched for money and stretched their consciences to grasp it. Kings and princes betrayed their allies and broke their most solemn pledges at the call of gold. Artists were no better. Many of them took advance payments, failed to finish or begin the work, but kept the money just the same. The papal court itself gave a high example of money lust. Here again, the greatest historian of the papacy. A deep-rooted corruption had taken possession of nearly all the officials of the Curia. The inordinate number of gratuities and exactions had passed all bounds. Moreover, on all sides, deeds were dishonestly manipulated and even falsified by the officials. No wonder that there arose from all parts of Christendom the loudest complaints about the corruption and financial extortions of the papal officials. It was even said that in Rome everything had its price. The Church still condemned all taking of interest as usury. Preachers inveighed against it. Cities, Piacenza, for example, sometimes forbade it under pain of exclusion from the sacraments and from Christian burial. But the lending of money at interest went on because such loans were indispensable in an expanding commercial and industrial economy. Laws were passed prohibiting a higher rate than 20%, but we hear of cases where 30% was charged. Christians competed with Jews in money lending, and the town council of Verona complained that the Christians exacted harder terms than the Jews. Public resentment, however, fell chiefly upon the Jews, and occasionally led to outbreaks of anti-Semitic violence. The Franciscans met the problem for the most helpless borrowers by establishing, through gifts and legacies, Monti di Pietà, funds, literally heaps, 
of charity, from which they made loans to the needy, at first without interest. The first of these was organized at Orvieto in 1463. Soon every major city had one. Their growth involved expenditures of administration, and the Fifth Lateran Council in 1515 granted the Franciscans the right to charge for each loan an amount necessary to cover the costs of management. Instructed by this experience, some theologians of the 16th century allowed a moderate interest on loans. Through the competition of the Monti di Pietà, and probably more through the increasing competence and rivalry of the professional bankers, the rate of interest fell rapidly during the 16th century. Industry became more ruthless with its size and with the disappearance of a personal relationship between employer and employed. Under feudalism, the serf had enjoyed certain rights along with his burdensome dues. In sickness, economic depression, war, and old age, his lord was expected to take care of him. In the cities of Italy, the guilds performed something of this function for the better class of labor. But in general, the free laborer was free to starve when he could find no work. When he found it, he had to take it on the employer's terms, and these were hard. Every invention and improvement in production and finance added to profits, rarely to wages. Businessmen were as severe with one another as with their employees. We hear of their many tricks in competition, their deceptive contracts, their innumerable frauds. When they cooperated, it was to ruin their competitors in another town. However, there were instances of a fine sense of honor among many Italian merchants, and the Italian financiers had the best reputation in Europe for integrity. Social morality was a blend of violence and chastity. In the correspondence of the times, we find many evidences of a tender and kindly spirit. And the Italians could not compete with the Spaniards in ferocity or with the French soldiery in wholesale butchery. Yet no nation in Europe could match the endless, merciless slander that swept all around prominent persons in Rome. And who but the Italians of the Renaissance could have called Aretino divine? Private violence flourished. Family feuds were refreshed by the breakdown of custom and belief and the inadequate administration of the laws. Men took vengeance into their own hands and families murdered one another for generations. At Ferrara, as late as 1537, dueling to the death was legal and practiced. Even boys were allowed to fight each other with knives in these legal lists. The strife of parties was bitterer than anywhere else in Europe. Crimes of violence were innumerable. Assassins could be bought almost as cheaply as indulgences. The palaces of Roman nobles swarmed with bravi, thugs ready to kill at a nod from their lords. Everyone had a dagger, and brewers of poison found many customers. At last the people of Rome could hardly believe in the natural death of any man of prominence or wealth. Important personages required that all food or drink served to them should first be tasted by another in their presence. Strange stories were told in Rome of a venenum a terminatum, a poison that took effect only after an interval long enough to cover up the trail of the poisoner. A man had to live on the alert in those days. Any evening, if he left the house, he might be ambushed and robbed, and be lucky not to be killed. Even in church he was not safe and on the highways he had to be ready for brigands. The Renaissance mind, living amid these dangers, had to be sharp as an assassin's blade. Sometimes cruelty was collective and contagious. At Arezzo in 1502, a riot broke out against an oppressive Florentine commission. Hundreds of Florentines in Arezzo were slain in the streets. Whole families were wiped out. One victim was stripped naked and hanged, and a lighted torch was thrust between his buttocks whereupon the jolly crowd nicknamed the corpse Il Sodomita. Tales of violence, cruelty, and lust were as popular as superstition. The court of Ferrara, brilliant with poetry and art, was ghastly with princely crimes and royal punishments. The irresponsibility of despots like the Visconti and the Malatestas provided a model and stimulus for the amateur violence of the people. The morals of war worsened with time. In the early days of the Renaissance, almost all battles were modest engagements of mercenaries who fought without frenzy and knew when to stop. Victory was judged won as soon as a few men had fallen, and a live, ransomable prisoner was worth more than a dead enemy. As the condottieri became more powerful and armies larger and more costly, troops were allowed to plunder captured cities in lieu of regular pay. Resistance to plunder led to the massacre of the inhabitants, and ferocity grew at the smell of the blood it shed. Even so, the cruelty of the Italians in war was far exceeded by the invading Spanish and French. 
When the French took Capua in 1501, says Guicciardini, they committed great slaughter, and women of all ranks and qualities, even such as were consecrated to the service of God, fell a sacrifice to their lust or avarice. Many of these poor creatures were afterwards sold at Rome for a small price, apparently to Christians. The enslavement of prisoners of war increased as the wars of the Renaissance progressed. There were instances of fine loyalty of man to man, of citizen to state, but by and large the development of cunning put a premium on deceit. Generals sold themselves to the highest bidder, and then in mid-campaign negotiated with the enemy for a higher price. Governments, too, changed sides in the middle of a war, and allies became foes by the scratch of a pen. Princes and popes violated safe conducts given by them. Governments consented to the secret assassination of their enemies in other states. Traitors could be found in any city or camp, instance Bernardino del Corte, who sold Lodovico's Castello to France, the Swiss and Italians who betrayed Lodovico to the French, Francesco Maria della Rovere, who kept his papal troops from going to the rescue of the Pope in 1527, Malatesta Baglioni, who sold out Florence in 1530. As religious belief declined, the notion of right and wrong was replaced in many minds by that of practicality. And as governments seldom enjoyed the authority of legitimation by time, the habit of obedience to law lapsed and custom had to be supplanted by force. Against the tyranny of governments, the only recourse was tyrannicide. Corruption ran through every department of administration. In Siena, the Bureau of Finance had finally to be put into the hands of a saintly monk, since everybody else had embezzled. Except in Venice, the courts were notoriously venal. One of Zacchetti's stories tells of a judge who was bribed with the gift of an ox, but the opponent sent the judge a cow and a calf and won his case. Justice was expensive. The poor had to get along without it and found it cheaper to kill than to litigate. Law itself was making some progress, but chiefly in theory. At Padua and Bologna, Pisa and Perugia, there were famous jurists, Cino da Pistoia, Bartolus of Sassoferrato, Baldo degli Ubaldi, whose reinterpretation of Roman law dominated jurisprudence for two centuries. Nautical and commercial law expanded as foreign trade increased. Giovanni da Legnano opened a path for Grotius with a Tractatus de Bello in 1360, the earliest known work on the laws of war. But the practice of law was less excellent than its theory. Though police protection of life and property was taking form, especially in Florence, it could not keep abreast of crime. Lawyers abounded. Torture continued to be used in the examination of witnesses as well as of the accused. Punishments were barbarous. In Bologna, a convict might be suspended in a cage from one of the leaning towers and left to fester in the sun. In Siena, a condemned man was slowly torn to pieces with red-hot pincers while bound to a cart slowly moving through the streets. In Milan, under Petrarch's host, Giovanni Visconti, prisoners were subjected to piecemeal mutilation. Early in the 16th century, the custom began of condemning prisoners to pull the heavy oars of galleys. So the ships of Julius II were manned by galley slaves, chained by the leg. Against these barbarities we may place the high development of organized charity. Every man who made a will left a sum to be distributed among the poor of his parish. Since beggars were numberless, some churches provided the equivalent of modern soup kitchens. So the Church of Santa Maria in Campo Santo at Rome fed thirteen beggars daily and two thousand on Mondays and Fridays. Hospitals, lazarettos, asylums for incurables, for the poor, for orphans, for destitute pilgrims, for reformed prostitutes, were numerous in Renaissance as in medieval Italy. Pistoia and Viterbo were celebrated for the scope of their charities. At Mantua, Lodovico Gonzaga established the Ospedale Maggiore for the care of the poor and infirm, and gave it three thousand ducats a year of governmental funds. At Venice, a society known as the Pellegrini, including in its membership Titian and the two Sansovini, provided mutual aid to its members, dowered poor girls, and practiced other charities. Florence in 1500 had 73 civic organizations devoted to works of charity. The Confraternita della Misericordia, founded in 1244 but allowed to decay, was restored in 1475. 
Its members were laymen who visited the sick, practiced other charities, and earned the love of the people by their courageous attendance upon victims of the plague. Their silent, black-robed processions are still among the most impressive sights of Florence. Venice had a similar confraternita di San Rocco. Rome had a sodality of the Dolorosa, now 504 years old, and Cardinal Giulio de' Medici founded in 1519 the Confraternita della Carità to take care of poor persons above the mendicant class and to provide decent burial for the destitute. The private charity of unrecorded millions lent some mitigation to the struggle of man against man, nature and death. 8. Manners and Amusements Amid violence and dishonesty and the boisterous life of university students and the rough humor and kindliness of peasant and proletaire, good manners grew as one of the arts of the Renaissance. Italy now led Europe in personal and social hygiene, dress, table manners, cooking, conversation, and recreations. And in all of these except dress, Florence claimed to lead Italy. Florence patriotically mourned the filth of other cities, and Italians made Tedesco, German, a synonym for coarseness of language and life. The old Roman habit of frequent bathing continued in the educated classes. The well-to-do displayed their finery and took the waters at various spas and drank sulfurous streams as an annual penance to purge digestive sins. Male dress was as ornate as female, except for jewelry. Tight sleeves and colored hose, and such wondrous baggy bonnets as Raphael caught on Castiglione. Hose ran up the legs to the loins, splitting men into prancing absurdities, but above the hips a man could be elegant in velvet tunic and silk frills and ruffles of lace. Even gloves and shoes sported wisps of lace. At a tournament given by Lorenzo de' Medici, his brother Giuliano wore garments costing eight thousand ducats. A revolution in table manners came in the fifteenth century with the increasing substitution of a fork for the fingers in carrying food to the mouth. Thomas Coriat, touring Italy about 1600, was struck by the novel custom, which, he wrote, is not used in any other country that I saw in my travels. And he shared in introducing the idea into England. Knives, forks, and spoons were of brass, sometimes of silver, which was lent out to neighbors preparing banquets. Meals were modest except on such outstanding occasions or at state functions. Then excess was compulsory. Spices, pepper, cloves, nutmeg, cinnamon, juniper, ginger, etc., were used in abundance to flavor food and stimulate thirst. Hence, every host offered his guests a variety of wines. The reign of garlic in Italy can be traced back to 1548, but doubtless had begun long before. There was very little drunkenness or gluttony. The Italians of the Renaissance, like the later French, were gourmets, not gourmands. When men ate apart from the women of their families, they might invite a courtesan or two, as Aretino did when he entertained Titian. More careful people would grace the meal with music, poetic improvisations, and educated conversation. The art of conversation, bel parlare, to speak with intelligence, urbanity, courtesy, clarity, and wit, was reinvented by the Renaissance. Greece and Rome had known it, and here and there in medieval Italy, as at the courts of Frederick II and Innocent III, it had been kept precariously alive. Now, in Lorenzo's Florence, in Elisabetta's Urbino, in Leo's Rome, it flourished again. Nobles and their ladies, poets and philosophers, generals and scholars, artists and musicians met in the companionship of minds, quoted famous authors, made an occasional obeisance to religion, graced their language with a light, fantastic touch, and basked in one another's audience. Such conversation was so admired that many essays and treatises were cast in dialogue form to appropriate its elegance. In the end, the game was carried to excess. Language and thought became too precious and refined. An enervating dilettantism softened manliness. Urbino became Rambouillet in France, and Molière attacked Les Précieuses Ridicules just in time to save the art of good converse for France. Despite the preciosity of the few, Italian speech enjoyed a freedom of subject and epithet that would not be allowed by social manners today. Since general conversation was rarely heard by unmarried women of good character, it was assumed that sex might be openly discussed. But beyond this, and even in the highest male circles, there was a looseness of sexual jest, a gay freedom in poetry, a coarse obscenity in drama, that seemed to us now among the 
less presentable aspects of the Renaissance. Educated men could scribble lewd verses on statuary. The refined Bembo wrote in praise of Priapus. Youths competed in obscenity and profanity to prove their maturity. Men of all classes swore great oaths and curses, often involving blasphemy of the most sacred names in the Christian faith. And yet the phrases of courtesy had never been so flowery, forms of address had never been so gracious. Women kissed the hand of any intimate male friend on meeting or leaving him, and men kissed the hand of a woman. Presents were ever passing from friend to friend, and tact of word and deed reached a development that seemed unattainable in northern Europe. Italian manuals of manners became favored texts beyond the Alps. The same was true of Italian handbooks of dancing, fencing, and other recreations. In recreation, as in conversation and profanity, Italy led the Christian world. On summer evenings, girls danced in the squares of Florence, and the most graceful won a silver garland. In the villages, young men and women danced on the green. In homes and at formal balls, women danced with women or men, and men with men or women. In any case, the aim was grace. In the Renaissance, the ballet flourished. The poetry of motion was added to the arts. Card-playing was even more popular than dancing. In the 15th century, it became a mania in all classes. Leo X was an addict. Often it involved gambling. Recall how Cardinal Raffaello Riario won 14,000 ducats in two games with the son of Innocent VIII. Men gambled also with dice and sometimes loaded them. This too became a passion, which legislation vainly sought to moderate. In Venice, gambling ruined so many noble families that the Council of Ten twice forbade the sale of cards or dice and called upon servants to report masters violating these ordinances. The Monte de Pietà, established by Savonarola in 1495, required of borrowers a pledge to avoid gambling at least till the loan had been paid. Sedate people brooded over chess and fondled expensive sets. Giacomo Loredano at Venice had chessmen valued at 5,000 ducats. Young men had their special games, mostly in the open air. The upper-class Italian was trained to ride, wield sword and lance, and tilt in tournaments. For such contests, the towns, on certain holidays, roped off space in a square, usually convenient to windows and balconies, whence the ladies could encourage their knights. As these combats proved insufficiently mortal, some rash youths, in the Roman Colosseum in 1332, introduced the bullfight, with a man on foot armed only with a spear. On that occasion, eighteen knights, all of old Roman families, were killed, and only eleven bulls. Such contests were occasionally repeated in Rome and Siena, but never caught the Italian taste. Horse racing was more popular, and aroused the enthusiasm of Romans, Sienese, and Florentines alike. Hunting, falconry, foot races, boat regattas, tennis, and boxing rounded out the sports, and kept the Italians individually in form, while collectively the defense of the cities was left to mercenary aliens. All in all, it was a gay life despite its toils and risks, its natural and supernatural terrors. City folk had the pleasure of walking or riding out to the countryside, to the banks of the rivers or the shores of the sea. They cultivated flowers to adorn their homes and persons, and, by their villas, carved stately gardens into geometrical forms. The church was generous with holy days, and the state added holidays of its own. Water festivals were held on the Venetian lagoons, on the Arno at Venice, the Mincio at Mantua, the Ticino at Milan. Or on special days, great processions moved down the city streets, with floats and banners designed for the guilds by artists of international renown. Bands played, pretty girls sang and danced, dignitaries marched and in the evening fireworks shot their evanescent wonder into the sky. On Holy Saturday in Florence, three flints brought from the Holy Sepulchre in Jerusalem lit a taper that lit a candle that, carried along a wire by a mechanical dove, reached and set off the fireworks in the caro, or emblematic car of state in the piazza before the cathedral. On Corpus Christi, the parade would be halted to hear a cantata sung by a choir of girls and boys, or see an episode of scriptural history or pagan mythology enacted by some confraternity. If a great dignitary came to town, he might be received with a trionfo, a procession arranged with chariots in the manner of a Roman triumph for a victorious general. When Leo X visited his beloved Florence in 1513, 
All the city turned out to watch his triumphal car, decorated and painted by Pontormo, pass under great arches that spanned the central street. Seven other chariots moved in that cavalcade, bearing impersonations of famous figures in Roman history. On the last, a naked boy, covered with guilt, represented the coming, with Leo, of the Golden Age. But the boy died shortly afterward from the effect of the guilt. At carnival time, the processional floats in Florence might symbolize some idea, like prudence, hope, fear, death, or the elements, the winds, the seasons, or tell in pantomime a story like Paris and Helen, or Bacchus and Ariadne, with songs appropriate to each scene. For such a mask, Lorenzo wrote his famous ode to youth and joy. On those carnival nights, everyone from urchins to cardinals wore masks, played pranks, and made love, with a freedom that revenged itself in advance for the restraints of Lent. In 1512, when Florence seemed still prosperous, but unsuspected misfortunes were only a few months away, Piero di Cosimo and Francesco Granacci designed for a carnival pageant a mask of the triumph of death. An enormous triumphal car, drawn by black buffaloes, was covered with a black cloth on which were painted skeletons and white crosses. In the car stood a colossal figure of death with a scythe in his hand. Around him were tombs and lugubrious figures on whose black robes were painted white bones gleaming in the dark. And behind the car masked figures walked, whose black hoods were painted with death heads both in front and behind. From the tombs on the cars rose other figures, painted to seem only bones, and these skeletons chanted a song reminding men that all must die. Before and after the car came a cavalcade of decrepit horses bearing the bodies of dead men. So at the height of carnival, Piero di Cosimo, echoing Savonarola, pronounced his judgment on the pleasures of Italy and his prophecy of the doom to come. 9. Drama in such masks and carnival fates, the Italian drama had one of its progenitors. For often some scene, usually from sacred history, would be performed on one of the floats or cars, or on temporary stages at points on the procession route. But the primary source of the Italian drama was the Devozione, an episode of the Christian story acted by the members of any guild, sometimes by professional players belonging to a confraternity that made a business of presenting such spectacles. The texts of several devozioni have come down through time and show a surprising dramatic power. So the Virgin, finding Christ in Jerusalem and then again losing him, searches frantically for him, crying out, O oh, my so loving son, O oh, my son, where have you gone? O oh, my so gracious son, through what gate have you gone? O oh, my divine son, you were so sorrowful when you left me. Tell me, for the love of God, where, where has my son gone? In the 15th century, especially in Florence, a more developed form of drama, the Sacra Rappresentazione, was played in the oratory of a guild, or in the refectory of a convent, or in a field or public square. The scenic arrangements for these performances were often complex and ingenious. Skies were simulated by vast awnings painted with stars. Clouds were represented by masses of wool suspended and swaying in the air. Angels were impersonated by boys, supported aloft on metal frames concealed in waving draperies. The libretto was usually in poetic form, accompanied with music on the viol or the lute. Lorenzo de' Medici and the Pulci were among the poets who wrote words for such religious plays. Politian, in his Orfeo, adapted the form of the Sacra Rappresentazione to a pagan theme. Meanwhile, other components of Italian life were sharing in the birth of Italian drama. The farce, or farces that had long been played by passing mummers in the medieval towns, contained the germ of Italian comedy. Some players excelled in improvising dialogue for simple scenarios or plots. This Commedia dell'arte was a favorite vehicle of the Italian genius for satire and burlesque. In such farces, the traditional masks or characters of popular comedy took form and name. Pantalone, Arlecchino, Pucinella or Punchinello. The humanists played their part in the complex of factors leading to the drama by restoring the texts and arranging performances of ancient Roman comedies. Twelve plays of Plautus were discovered in 1427 and served as an additional stimulus. At Venice, Ferrara, Mantua, Urbino, Siena, Rome, 
The comedies of Plautus and Terence were staged, and the old classic tradition soared over centuries to form again a secular theatre. In 1486, the Menechmi of Plautus was for the first time presented in Italian, and the transition from ancient to Renaissance drama was fully prepared. Toward the end of the 15th century, the religious drama lost its hold on educated audiences in Italy. Pagan subjects increasingly replaced Christian themes, and when native dramatists like Bibbiena, Machiavelli, Ariosto, and Aretino wrote plays, it was in the ribald style of Plautus, a world away from the once-beloved stories of Mary and Christ. The old scenes of Roman comedy, all the superficial plots turning on mistaken sex or identity or rank, all the stock characters, including panders and prostitutes, with which Plautus had pleased the groundlings, all the old plebeian coarseness and rough play reappeared in these Italian comedies. Despite the preservation of Seneca's plays and the recovery of the Greek drama, tragedy never acquired a standing on the Renaissance stage. Even the upper classes wished to be amused rather than deepened, and turned a cold eye upon John Tricino's Sophonisba of 1515 and Giovanni Rucelli's Rosamunda, which in the same year was performed in the Rucelli Gardens at Florence before Leo X. It was the misfortune of Italian comedy that it took form when Italian morals were at nadir, that such plays as Bibiena's Calandra and Machiavelli's Mandragola could satisfy the tastes of the Italian upper classes, even at refined Urbino, and could be performed before popes without arousing protest, reveals again how intellectual freedom can comport with moral deterioration. When the Counter-Reformation came with the Council of Trent, in 1545 and following, the morals of clergy and laity were severely censored, and the comedy of the Renaissance was banished from the amusements of Italian society. 10. Music It was a redeeming feature of Italian comedy that ballets, pantomimes, and concerts were presented as intermezzi between the acts. For next to love itself, music was the chief recreation and consolation of every class in Italy. Montaigne, traveling in Tuscany in 1581, was astounded to see peasants with lutes in their hands and beside them shepherds reciting Ariosto by heart. But this, he adds, is what we may see in all of Italy. Renaissance painting has a thousand representations of people playing music, from the luting angels at the Madonna's feet in so many coronations, and Melozzo's serenading seraphim, to the quiet exaltation of the man at the harpsichord in the concert. And note the boy, whom we can hardly believe to be the painter himself, in the center of Sebastiano del Piombo's Three Ages of Man. The literature likewise conveys a picture of a people singing or playing music in their homes, at their work, on the street, in music academies, monasteries, nunneries, churches, in processions, masks, trionfi, and pageants, in religious or secular plays, in the lyric passages and interludes of dramas, in such outings as Boccaccio imagined in the Decameron, Rich men kept a variety of musical instruments in their homes and arranged private musicales. Women organized clubs for the study and performance of music. Italy was, is, mad about music. Folk song flourished at all times, and learned music periodically rejuvenated itself at that fount. Popular melodies were adapted for complex madrigals, for hymns, even for passages in music for the mass. This book is continued at this point on the other side of this cassette. Please reverse or turn the cassette over now.